think we're working now, so let's get right into this. Um, so we left off on chapter, uh, part one of chapter two, where we talked about time dilation, and we talked about um, pr uh, proper time, and we talked about the non, uh, uh, the non um, trivial structure to space time. I want to set up an argument now. All right, so the book, uh, again, goes into this. We're starting to go into chapter, uh, part 2.6 here. Um, but I want to sort of frame this in sort of an argument way, right? So like sort of a large logical argument. Um, so, so, so something that you might have seen maybe in your uh, intro to philosophy class, right? So in this, court, in this part, we, we want to establish the idea of a four vector. So four, so, so uh, write this out, four vector. What exactly is a four vector? How, how can we justify using four vectors? So let's let's get right into this. So we found, let's see, we found that um, space time, so space time contains four dimensions to it. So one space time contains uh, contains four dimensions. If I spell something wrong, this isn't an English class, so it doesn't matter. Um, T, X, Y, and Z. These are our four dimensions. Um, number two is that space-time has a non-trivial structure to it. Right? So, two space-time has a non-trivial structure. All right, so this non-trivial structure is that we have, um, our convention is like that in space time, as opposed to just space or, yeah, just space. Okay. So that means if space-time contains four dimensions and it has a non-trivial structure to it, that means um, in four dimensions, we have a non-trivial structure, right? So conclusion, conclusion, I spelled that wrong. I'll just put C for the conclusion. Um, uh, four dimensions has or have has a non-trivial structure. All right, this is weird. Where am I going with this? And again, I have sun glare. I can try to move the camera a little bit. Um, so where am I going with this? I'm simply saying that we need now, so we, um, instead of when we move into four dimensions, we can, we can't, no, we can no longer use, um, and this of course includes time, right? So time, um, this is, of course, in question, we, we could have four dimensions of just space, right? Uh, but we, when we implement time, so I'll, I'll make that a little bit more specific. When we implement time, so this sort of begs the question, right? So what objects live in this space that have a time component? and three spatial components to them. And what we're going to find is that these objects are four vectors. Right? So it's four vectors 
live in space-time. And we, let's go ahead and let, let's take a look now at uh, what these four vectors might look like. So the, the big one that we're interested in um, is going to be, uh, if we go to the book here, the big one that we want to be interested in is the energy momentum relationship. Right, so right off the bat, I'll just give I'll just give you the punchline here. Right off the bat, the energy momentum relationship is um, we have energy as our temporal component, and we have momenta in the x direction, momentum in the y direction, and momentum in the z direction. Um, this is our, this is going to be a four vector. This is going to be our, what's called, um, relativistic energy moment, or the relativistic energy momentum relationship, or the energy momentum four vector. All right, so this is the energy momentum four vector. So, again, I can't reiterate this as much as I can reiterate this as much as I can because I'm not um, I'm not constrained by any by any time here like you are in most classes. Uh, this is going to be extremely extremely important because these are the only the, the, these four vectors are really the only types of objects we can deal with when we're talking about space time, right? And given the fact that we need to use the time dilation formula in order to have, in order to preserve distances, um, we are going to have to uh, use time to, we're, we're going to have to we're going to have to use these four vectors in order to work within the domain of special relativity and also in order to work within the domain of quantum field theory. Now, we can also, we, if we take a look at the, in the book here, um, there's a little bit of a change uh, here when it comes to labeling stuff, right? So bear with me here, but when we label um, four dimensions, we could either label like this, um, delta x, one delta x two actually i'll go like this we can i'll go like this delta x actually you know i'll go like this delta t delta x delta y and delta z right that it's all fine and good but eventually if we want if we want to have more dimensions right we're gonna run out of the alphabet eventually so if we do is this gets translated into um, delta x zero, that's the zeroth component, delta x one, delta x two, and delta x three. And this enables us to add, hack on more dimensions if, if we need to, or if we want to. But anyways, we're gonna make this change uh, right here. So this is a change we're gonna make. Similarly with the energy momentum relationship, we're gonna we're gonna do instead of E um, P X uh, P Y and P Z, we're gonna use P zero, P one, P two, and P three. Okay. So now let's get into um, inner products because this is also going to be really important. But I'm going to try to get this glare out of the back of my um, my camera first. All right. So I think the glare is away now. Or it's gone. That should work. Okay. 
So we were talking about four, we're starting to talk about four vectors and how these are going to be important in special relativity. And again, to just get to the punchline, again, the, we need four vectors because we have space time, right? Space time is this, is this, mathemat this mathematical object that has this, again, this non-trivial structure to it. And um, given that it has this non-trivial structure, we need to figure out what these four vectors actually look like now because um, when you do the inner product on, say, two vectors that live in space, right? When you do the inner product on two vectors that live in space, you inevitably get, uh, um, not inevitably, but you get uh, a positive, you get positive uh, values um, for, if you just had a generic uh, positive vector in space. Like, so if you had, well, let's put this in, let's put this in writing. If we had, say, our vector A, and this is coming out of page 53. And our vector looks like this. X2 and X3. And we had vector B that contains different components, but the same basis. The inner product, again, is that's going to give us um, this notion of uh, a distance, right? So, and when we take the inner product of A with B, when we take the inner product of A with B, um, this is going to be A dot B, right? So A dot B, this is the inner product. We could talk about outer products and tensor products later. This is the inner product A with B, and this is telling, this, what this tells us, this is that gives us a distance between A and B. Right? And the way we compute this, um, it, this is going to be a number, right? So the dot product takes in, if you remember anything from uh, any, some of your math classes maybe, is that the dot product is really kind of just a machine, right? It, it takes two vectors and it outputs a number. And the way it's going to do that is it's, it, you're going to, um, you take one vector, you take one vector, and we can lie it on its side here. This is probably the easiest way to do this. We lie it on its side like this, x1, x2, and x3. Remember, this is just the t, x, y, and z dimensions. And we're going to multiply this by x0, x1, x2, and x3. And what do we get? Well, we do this sort of multiplication where we do this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this, plus this times this. Right? And so what we get is x0 squared plus x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. That's all fine and good, but we have no we have no minus signs in here. We have no minus signs in here, and that's a problem. Um, because again our non-trivial structure to space-time has minus signs in it. So what do we do? What we do is we make, um, we do, we want to do A dot B. What we have to do is we have to make one of these minus, have one of these be the opposite sign basically or the other. So this is gonna be, so this in this case, it was for just space. And now let's do a case where we're looking at space-time. In space-time, we so the distance between two vectors, um, a and b, is going to be x0 times x1 times x2 times minus x3. And that's going to be, zoom in a little bit more here, x 
0, x1, x2, and x3, like that. You can, you can see now what the consequence of this is. This is x0 squared, plus, or minus, actually, minus, oops, minus x1 squared, minus x2 squared, minus x3 squared. And that checks out. So in four, so in space time, in space time, we're dealing with four vectors and the inner product between the two is an inner product between one and the minus of the other, but not necessarily the minus of the complete other. It's the minus of just the um, of just the temporal or the spatial components, right? So, um, so we need a way of this is say you had a four vector. Uh, this four vector lives in space time. We need a way of converting that four vector such that the result is um, an object that looks like just the spatial components have been changed by, by their signs. So that if we ever need an object like that to compute an inner product, we can do that. All right, so what, so the question is in space time, what is the tool that we use to make this conversion from a four vector that has um, a, a four vector that has no, uh, that has an, op from a four vector to a four vector that has uh, the spatial components merely changed. And again, this is outlined on page 54 of Schwittenberg's book, but um, long story short, the idea is that we use something called a Minkowski metric. And it's the only metric that we can use to make this conversion. We can't use a simple Euclidean metric because a Euclidean metric is just one along the diagonal of the matrix that's associated with that change, right? So that's a lot, but it's not, uh, mathematically speaking, it's, it really just looks something like this. So we're going to condense our notation a little bit here, right? So I, it, when I say, I'm going to say, um, delta x mu. What this is, this is, this is one vector and it has four components to it. The mu runs through um, zero to three, right? So this is uh, equal to um, a vector like this. That's, so that's a four vector. So whenever we see something like this, this is a vector, right? We can do stuff to this vector, right? And one of the things that we want to do to this vector is transform it in a way, not transform it, but change it in a way such that just the just the spatial components are changed. And the way we do that is through something called a Minkowski metric, right? So um, it looks like this. It's like a curly N, N as in um, the word new. Uh, that's <laughs> new, I, I say new for other reasons in physics. Um, N as in the word um, uh, noodle. <laughs> Anyways, um, we use, um, and we have two indices on this because this is kind of like a, a matrix in a sense. And this matrix looks something like this, uh, one, negative one, negative one, negative one. And we have zeros elsewhere. So, that looks like this.
there's our space time. Uh, this is our this is called the Minkowski. metric um, and this Minkowski metric we can compare this to say something like uh, just a regular Euclidean metric right so the Euclidean metric it, again you can you can label it in the book it's the Euclidean metric is really just uh, GE um, and in the book is also this also calls this GM for Euclidean metric, but um, where the, the, there's different notations for this, it's, that's all this. That's all this is. Um, GE would be just ones along the diagonal, and we can see if we were to use um, if we were to use the if we were to use this metric, this one. Um, where um, we won't be able to recover, we won't be able to get any negative signs from using it. Whereas if we use this one, we can. So I'm just gonna go ahead and erase this one. Okay. And what we're gonna do now is we're gonna say, let's, take, let's do an example. So what is, um, what is this? Mu, mu, delta x, mu, right? Well, this is equal to um, that uh, our Minkowski metric. Uh, I'm just going to copy it. See if I can paste. There we go. And then I'm going to copy this guy. Our Paste that. And what is this going to equal? Well, we do this is a simple um, a met, a matrix multiplied by a vector, right? So this is going to be delta x naught. Um, this is just going to result in another matrix. I'm going to give myself some space here. Delta x naught. Delta x one, delta x two, and delta x three, with minus signs on those guys. Right. So now, if we wanted to compute the met the inner product, we would do something like this. So the inner product between two vectors, say a and b is equal to a dot b which is this is going to give us a number and the number again is going to give us as a formula this is get this is going to be um we have this guy here this guy right here we want to multiply it by another vector Right. And the other vector is going to have this different component on it. So we can say this multiplied with a dot product of, a, of another vector like that. Um, and so this here is a vector, right? This here is a vector, which means that this looks something like um, x nu, x nu, like that. So essentially what this has done, this Euclidean, or this, um, this, Minkowski, this Minkowski metric, has made it, it is a tool. This is really just a tool in helping us to change uh, the spatial components on a vector so that we can do stuff like the, the inner product and, and do stuff like that. Okay. And we can see also through a very 
tangible example, also we can see that um, this here, this right here, this is some inner product already. We just need to put this out here to accommodate for our space-time structure. For our, and so this is sort of an inner product between two vectors already, and this just accounts for space-time. So it's a space-time inner product, if you will, right? It's, um, and this is gonna be very, very useful for us. And this takes us to, you know, I was, this takes us through page 56 and 57, and even through um, 50, uh, 859, we've sort of covered a lot of this already. I want to skip over to page 60 now, where we're going to talk about um, uh, just some last minute things on the energy momentum tensor or the energy momentum relationship. And so in order to do that, uh, we want to consider now um, Uh, we we want to we want to so now that we have these tools in our in our toolbox, uh, let, let's let's recap. Let's recap before we get any further. So, what we've talked about so far is we've talked about space time. So here's a recap. So we've talked about space the non-trivial structure of space time. Non-trivial. structure of space-time and how this is sort of fundamentally different than that of the structure of just space. Uh, and then we went into talking about the time dilation. Time dilation formula, that was important in helping us understand what proper time was. Remember, proper time was this idea that um, it was, it's the time uh, that one experiences in order to preserve distances, right? And that came from time dilation. Um, so we talked about the non-trivial structure of space-time. We talked about time dilation. And then we finished our time dilation in our first part of our special relativity um, uh, review. And then we went into talking about four vectors and why four vectors were important. Right, so four vectors uh, came from considering the four dimensions of space-time. Considering the four dimensions, dimensions of space-time. And then we talked about the Minkowski metric. Minkowski metric as a tool to accommodate, to as a tool to um, implement, to implement four vectors in with the structure of space-time, in with the non-trivial triv structure of space-time. Okay? So that's what we've done. This is all super, super important. And uh, I promise after this video, we're going to get into chapter three, which is going to be, um, you know, actually, it might take another video or two. We, we also want to talk about Lorentz transformations. Um, but then we're going to talk about fields after that. So 
But without further ado, let's get right into talking about the energy momentum relationship and um, different types of transformations. And once we're done talking about that, then we're going to do a full dive into fields. We're going to start off with classical fields, uh, and then we're going to move on to um, uh, sort of investigating those classical fields, how they interact. Uh, that's how this book is structured, if I remember correctly. And then, and then we're going to talk about quantum fields. What makes uh, classical fields quantum? And we're going to see. You know, I'll I'll do this. I'll um, give I'll give you a teaser here. We're going to see that fundamentally, what makes um, what makes these fields quantum is um, a commutation relationships. We're going to because what we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to see that. Uh, we have these fields. We can do any. We can do anything we really want with these fields. We can investigate their dynamics. We can investigate, excuse me, uh, various different parts of the uh, aspects of these quanta, of these classical fields. Uh, but then, we want to be able to consider um, the Heisenberg. Well, once we consider the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and once we consider. Um, the idea of uh, um, what's it called? Uh, the idea of uh, commutation relationships. When we apply those to our fields, then we get quantum fields, and we're going to see what the consequences of that are, um, and we're going to study their interactions, and then hopefully this will be a good vi a good playlist so that we can get into more advanced topics in particle physics and topological quantum field theories and conformal field theories. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to tie uh, some of this in with I some ideas in general relativity, which is going to be fun. Uh, very, very fun indeed. Okay. So I actually am going to put this in this video talking about the energy momentum relationships um, just so that we can get a review done and over with so that we can get into fields quicker. Um, so what we want to talk about now, let's get a new slide up here. I want to talk about, so this energy momentum relationship, we sort of have this, have this tool now at our disposal of uh, switching the components of a vector in a way so that they sort of they can accommodate for the space-time structure in which again we have uh, negative signs on our spatial components and positive signs on our temporal component um, and that's what the Minkowski metric does so just as a recap the Minkowski metric metric is a tool that looks like this um, with zeros on all sides in which it helps us take some four vector in space time and convert it in a way so that we can get a proper notion of what it means to have an inner product on this space. So, in contrast with the with the um, Euclidean, metric, we have this we have this this structure, right? We have one, 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 one with zeros everywhere else. Um, that, it won't work. This metric won't work. This is what I wrote down here, sort of non-intentionally, was a four-dimensional, strictly spatial, if we're talking, if we're not talking um, abstract mathematics, and we're talking physics, this this is a structure that would not work for space-time, because it doesn't, it, it doesn't preserve distances, as we've seen, um, when we apply the uh, when we apply the notion of time dilation. 
recall also that delta s squared is the invariant thing. Right? That's the invariant distance that we get when we apply these two uh, when we when we apply these two vectors together, right? And when we apply the two vectors together, recall that we need to get something like c squared times delta t squared minus delta x squared minus delta y squared minus delta z squared. This is the invariant thing, right? This this thing right here, this is what's called an, an invariant quantity. Um, because again, when we're still, it doesn't change. And when we're moving, it doesn't change, right? So invariant still versus moving. This is something squared, right? Remember when we square some, this should tell. This should give us this this idea rings in our mind of sort of measuring the hypotenuse of a, of a right triangle, right? The thing that is left unchanged is the magnitude of that of that hypotenuse. Not really, not the direction. The mag it's the magnitude that's being preserved, and it's a number, right? It's it's a number. So. More generally, we're speaking of a number. This del this delta s squared. This is a this is what's regarded as being in the real numbers. This is a real number uh, that comes out of uh, this this and this is the product, the inner product of two vectors, as we've seen. And the inner product of those two vectors is only possible through the uh, Minkowski metric when we are talking about space-time, okay? So I like to draw things out a little bit. If we have some field, the Minkowski metric allows us to take two vectors, two four vectors at a single point like, like this, and from these two, from these two four vectors, from these two four vectors, we apply the Minkowski metric, right? And we get out of that a number. Okay. Um, this is a very crude way of thinking about this, but it it allows us to hopefully organize things in our head a little bit better. So let's talk about the energy momentum relationship now. I want to consider, so the, the book considers um, this quantity x, big X equals P mu, P mu, right? So this again, this is a squared quantity, just like delta S squared, the squared is momentum squared, right? This is two four vectors, two four momentum vectors, and um, we want to know essentially kind of what the hypotenuse or what the uh, um, what the invariant quantity is when we do this when, when we apply a formal when, when we square the moment the momentum vector with itself or when we multiply the momentum vector with itself um, the fact that we have a mu here in in our upper condition, conditional case, in our low conditional case, is reminiscent of the fact that when we did, if I can go back here, when we did this, uh, where was it? Somewhere around here. Maybe not, maybe I erased it. Oh, right here, actually. So this right here, this, when we do this, uh, this will raise our index, right? So this, this here will raise our index so that we get something like, um, like that. So essentially, it's the same vector. It's just that 
it's just the, the vector that's converted from uh, into that, that, that minus form, right? So we can go back. So this is, it's just the same vector. It's, it, it's the same vector. It's just, it, there's a slightly, there's a slight different, slightly different. So we can write this as, um, we can write this as uh, P mu. Uh, so times the Euclidean metric on this higher P mu on P nu. Right, because this here is the same as this. And we've seen that now, <clears throat> excuse me. So what is this? So if we, <coughs> excuse me. So the temporal component, I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna, this is, again, we're calling this a special relativity review, so I'm not gonna go over every detail in special relativity, but the temporal component of the, um, <coughs> the four momentum vector, <coughs> excuse me, is this, it's the energy divided by the, by the, um, by the speed of light, and we're gonna see why. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and then we have Px, P, Y, and P, Z, okay? That's our, that's our four momentum. And then we have our Minkowski metric. Like this. And we have our other vector. Um, we're not really talking about covectors or vector or anything like that yet. We will, but not not right now. Um, so we're going to do this again. P x, P y, and P z. What we're going to get when we do this this multiplication of these four vectors, let's see if I can, is we're gonna get uh, these guys right here that are gonna change the signs on these, right? So we just get, if I can, I'll select this, and I'll copy it, and let's bring it up here. Bring it up here. It's going to be minus signs, and then uh, we have our e over c, p x, p y, and p z. And this is what our invariant quantity is. Right. And so now, what we want to do, so we, we can take this as the inner product, right? So this is going to be e squared over c squared minus px um, squared minus p uh, y squared minus p z squared and then we take we could take this these are the momenta in the spatial the spatial coordinates of the momenta and we can write it like this Where the line over the p denotes uh, the spatial vector of the momentum. Okay. <clears throat> so if p equals zero in all cases, if p equals zero, if the mom if the momentum of an object is zero, i.e., it's not moving in the x direction. Um, if it's not again, if it's not moving in the x direction. Um, then our invariant quantity, then, there, then our invariant quantity is just going to be e squared over c squared. And 
So if we multiply both sides by c squared, we get c squared times our invariant quantity equals e squared. Okay, so then we can say, well, if our invariant quantity, if our invariant quantity is m squared, c squared, then what does that, the, what does that give us? Well, if, again, if our invariant quantity is the mass of our object times c squared, then we get m squared c to the fourth equals e squared. Okay. Well, that means e equals mc squared. So add, that's in the case when we're not moving. When we're not moving in the x, y, z, or direction, in the x, or y, or z direction, then we recover this formula. The energy of the object is proportional to the mass of the object by c squared. So we're left with saying that x, our invariant quantity, is if that if it, it's it must therefore be that um, uh, m squared c squared equals what we had. So e squared over c squared minus p squared. This is an important relationship, and we're going to let's see, we're going to use this now to our advantage, so that we can. Uh, I'm going to. This is important. This is our energy, momentum relationship. This is very, very important. So we're going to use this now to our advantage to try to figure out some things here. We're good. We want to uh, determine now. Um, but let's let's take a look at this a little bit deeper, actually. So what we're going to do, what we can do here is we can really just rearrange a few things. If we rearranged a few things, then um, we ultimately can get to this point. Now, let's do, let's just do this by hand here. So e squared over c squared, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to rearrange this first. And we are left with, um, I have notes in front of me too, just so I don't go astray. We are left with, uh, just by rearranging this, like this, uh, plus uh, p squared like that. All right, so what I've done is, just to save a little bit of time actually, is to uh, do a lot of this little, a lot of this algebraic busy work. Just to show you how this goes, um, again, our aim is to get our energy is to know what the form of our energy is after we've made, after we've come to this energy momentum relationship. We want to isolate the energy basically, and we, we want to see what that looks like. And we, what we come to is something actually kind of interesting. Um, so here, so I'll explain the steps here. So this is just, again, this is rearranging uh, this right here. Uh, again, more algebraic manipulation, we're just divide, or multiplying both sides by c squared. Uh, and p squared here, we can regard as p times p momentum squared, basically. And we're also taking out m squared c to the fourth. So we have to divide this side by m squared c to the fourth. And when we do that, we're going to be able to cancel some c's out. That's what we're doing right here. Right? Um, so I've copied that up here, and we have in our next step, basically just replacing p times p with momentum times momentum. Momentum again being um, mass times velocity. So that here's our mass squared times our velocity squared 
over mass squared times c squared. And then we can take this out because the square root of this is just mc squared. And that's interesting. E equals mc squared times some factor. Um, and this isn't the case when we're moving, right? So this is interesting, right? So we have, we could Taylor expand this. So this is something that people were interested in back, uh, people would try to play with uh, back then when they were, when they, oh, physicists do this all the time, actually. You know, Taylor expansion is one of our best, a physicist's best friend. Um, there's a lot of Taylor expansion everywhere. You'll see it everywhere. So it, it'll be good to get a handle on Taylor expansion. So basically what Taylor expansion is, is a way of uh, approximating a function um, by doing by doing this, right? So we have our a function which is uh, at some point, and then we have the derivatives, the subsequent derivatives of that function being weights uh, to the uh, other order approximations. Right, so we could take the first derivative of this function, and it looks like this, right, because we're taking the derivative of the whole thing, which is one half times the inside times, Edward. this is just, again, definition of derivatives. If you haven't taken calculus yet, uh, quantum field theory might be tricky to go through. But nevertheless, I'm kind of assuming, again, that uh, there are some prerequisites that you've had already in order to understand some of this, but I, I do intend to not gloss over the details. I don't want to gloss over the details. I want to have this quantum field theory be completely transparent to us so that we can better understand it. Um, and, I'm, yeah, and so, again, the derivative of this is right here. And then the, deriv the second derivative of this is taking the derivative of this, right? So the derivative of this is going to be the derivative of this first part times this plus the derivative of this times this, right? So the derivative of the first part is just one, right? Times this is just this. And then the derivative of the second part, well, we're going to have x times something, right? So you, we don't necessarily have to write the rest of this out, but this is, what, this is what it is. But the reason we don't have to is because when we do our f prime of x naught, again, x naught being zero, we're just gonna get one, right? Because when we put zero into here, that's, a good, that's gonna make this whole thing go to zero. So this whole thing essentially goes to zero when we do this. Right. So what we end up with is f of x, our approximated form is equal to one plus x squared because x naught is zero right here, or we're actually here, because this was zero. So one, plus x squared over 2 factorial, right? So over 2 factorial. Um, so this is our second order approximation of, so this is our second order approximation of one plus x squared. This is interesting to us because if we set x squared equal to uh, what we have up here, right here, then we come to the following. Uh, we'll come to um, e being equal to mc squared times 1 
plus 1 over 2 m squared v squared over m squared c squared. Okay, we're almost there, I promise. Just a few more steps. Um, so we have um, this, this is an approximation on E now, right? So what we can do is we can cancel a few things and cancel ends, the mass of our object. And what we essentially get now is um, m squared or mc squared times one plus one half um, v squared over c squared. Okay. Well, now if we, this is approximately equals, we can now multiply this out, almost there, I promise. We get mc squared plus one half mv squared, and then the c squareds are gonna cancel. You can see how that works. So E approximately equals mc squared plus one half mv squared. And what's, what's one half mv squared? That's the kinetic energy. That's the kinetic energy of the particle. So this is, so when we made those assumptions, not really assumptions, but when we go, going back to this slide, when we did this and we said, and we said that um, our invariant quantity was this, we said our invariant quantity was this because uh, we said if P was equal to zero, if our momentum uh, was equal to zero, then we would arrive at this, which would make us arrive to this, which would say, make us say that X must have been this, but this was, this was the case when P was equal to zero, right? So by making that, by saying, okay, we're going to assume that X is this, when we make this assumption, when we make this assumption, we have to then approximate what E has to be under this assumption, under the assumption when P equals zero. And when P equals zero, um, we have to take into account the kinetic energy of the particle, right? So if it has, it, 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 so it's gonna have, it's gonna have kinetic energy and it's gonna have um, this energy due to when it's, due to just the, the body of it having masses, essentially. And that's a second order approximation. What you could do for fun, if you wanted to, is you can say that uh, we can, we could try, we, you could do more approximations, right? You could uh, figure out what E is to a higher order approximation of the particle. Um, so we have, again, so again, we have to find the kinetic energy of the particle when P equals zero, which is going to be very small, right? Because P is zero. So if P is zero, um, then this essentially could go away, right? And we're left with E equals MC squared. But if P is not zero, then, then again, we have, um, we have this correction order. So this is a very interesting phenomenon that we've come to. So I'll, I'll box this. Um, this is, so this is our energy approximation. Um, and this comes to the conclusion of chapter two for this book. Um, Again, or not, actually, this is not the conclusion of chapter two. We still have Lorentz and Poincaré transformations to deal with.
and I will we'll deal with that in uh, the next video because I, again I don't want these to go on for I don't want these to go on for too long and um, yeah so we're gonna do a brief recap of Lorentz and Poincaré transformations in in the next video and then we're gonna jump into fields classical fields uh, and and all that fun stuff so I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.